All right, looks like we're uh, we're recording. Uh, and everyone's coming in. And Lil, you just keep letting people in as needed. That'd be great. Yep. Everyone should come in automatically. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, right on. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Dale Kirby. I'm the Principal Program Manager uh, with Local Land Services, uh, and tonight we've got uh, we've got a few people on the call with us. Um, but just wanted to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners on the various lands we meet today. I'm on Wiradjuri country today, um, and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge any First Nations people on the call tonight. Um, so yeah, like I uh, thank you all for for registering uh, and joining this event on Fall Armyworm as a livestock industries update. Um, obviously, we have seen Fall Armyworm cause some pressure uh, in New South Wales, and it was first found in 2020 uh, in New South Wales, and primarily had been a, a pest that was impacting uh, corn and sorghum. And but we've seen that obviously with a a range of um, of good seasonal conditions, we've actually seen the pest pressure has increased, and we're starting to see it cause impacts on uh, on other industries. So we wanted to uh, we wanted to start tonight by just giving a bit of background uh, and talk about a bit of a uh, a local context for uh, for fall armyworm as it uh, impacts uh, the north coast, the Hunter, and other areas of New South Wales. Um, so to give us a bit of an update on uh, what conditions are like on the ground, uh, we've got Peter Beale. So Peter is a local land services staff member who's based at Tokal. Um, Peter's going to talk about the uh, the range of impacts that we've been seeing on the ground. So thanks, Peter. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, this year has been um, quite exceptional, but just to put this in context, army worm. Uh, as a species, and there are two or three species, have been around for many years. Traditionally, they um, they begin hatching in the spring, and I've seen army worm in spring ryegrass. They build up over summer and reach a peak in populations in, in that uh, late autumn, February, March, where we do see sp spasmodically they, um, they will attack seedling um, oats and ryegrass as they emerge. So this is not new in the sense of, the, of armyworms, but the, um, the difference this year is that these early populations that have really been spread right up and down the coast and in very, very high numbers uh, were largely the fall armyworm and uh, not so many, but, but still present are southern armyworm. And uh, that's left us with a position where we really have no uh, chemical salvage options, which has really been uh, quite a shift. In the past, there were, uh, with just Southern Army Worm, there were options you could use to, um, to control it. This year, we just haven't had that. The conditions, for whatever reason, uh, long, wet summer, um, very warm, February allowed those populations to build up to numbers that we, we haven't seen for some years. And so that whole, whole crops, uh, or at least oats and um, ryegrass sown particularly after um, after the uh, uh, after a maize crop or after a sorghum crop were just nearly wiped out, Six, 60, 70 percent of the paddock wiped out. And that's not something we've seen. Um, so to, tonight we'll be discussing that. Um, I will say too that these these sort of outbreaks are spasmodic, but they have been at Gloucester, Kempsey, um, and right up into Queensland, where um, one of our speakers will be talking about. So it it is of concern, and uh, it's something we really have to look at. So hand it back to you, Dale. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And. Yeah, you've like you said, you've seen it in a, a range of locations uh, and a, a range of crop types as well. So not just the traditional uh, corn and, and sorghum or sweet corn that uh, that we've seen it in. Um, so in terms of, I guess, the broader impacts and understanding more about the pest, 
Um, tonight we've got Melina Miles uh, here to talk to us. So Melina is a principal entomologist um, with the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. And Melina's joined us tonight from Toowoomba uh, to talk about the broader impacts and a bit of life cycle information for fall armyworms. So we better get to understand this best. Uh, thanks, Melina. Thank you very much, Dale. Can you, uh, you can see my slideshow now? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, so as Dale said, the focus uh, this evening is to, um, I guess, go through the challenges with fall armyworm in uh, winter fodder crops and grain crops. And I guess in this presentation is split into two bits. And in the second bit, I'll talk a little bit about uh, spring and particularly maize, uh, either for grain or for fodder. So the key messages really are that with reports uh, all the way from central Queensland down through New South Wales, that fall armyworm has been very widespread, particularly um, in southern Queensland through February and March and into April, and then uh, a little bit later in central Queensland. I think now with the cooling temperatures, the risk is diminishing in most areas, but it still would be very prudent to check uh, young crops, particularly emerging crops, within 10 days of emergence. And the 10 days uh, will come a bit clear as we talk about the influence of temperature on uh, the life cycle and the rate of development and, and the potential for damage. So in addition to just the presence of fall armyworm, given that the cooling temperatures are likely to negatively impact fall armyworm, not kill it overnight if you have a frost, certainly uh, they are able to withstand those sorts of um, temperatures for a short period of time. But cumulatively, prolonged cold temperature will result in the populations uh, going into decline. And not only does it cause the larvae to hang around in the crop for longer, just that they develop sl more slowly, but that allows time for other mortality factors to play a role, things like predators, parasitoids, uh, just the weather. So it now becomes important to assess not only whether fall armyworm are there, but also how many there are and how much damage they're doing in relation to the progression of the crop. So crops that are growing rapidly are at less risk than crops that are slower because of cool weather or uh, wet weather or dry weather. Uh, and keep in mind that it's the medium and large larvae that we're particularly concerned about in terms of immediate crop loss. Um, Pete's just outlined a range of crops that have been impacted this year. This is the first time that we've seen impacts on winter crops in any sort of uh, on any sort of scale other than the very occasional early sown oats in the past. And I'll talk a little bit later about the, the high density of fall armyworm uh, that we've seen in crops through summer and now into autumn in uh, 2024 and how that might impact uh, the abundance of fall armyworm and, and the impact on early sown crops uh, come spring. If we're talking about native pastures and even uh, you know exotic sown pastures, improved pastures, there's been no work to date uh, on those specifically. So we're sort of working in the dark when it comes to the specific management of those. But I think we can extrapolate quite a bit from the work that we've done uh, in maize and sorghum and sweet corn. Why are they so damaging this year? Well, I think for those reasons that Peter just mentioned that uh, you know, the highest activity that we have seen in summer crops since 2020 may be a result of really favourable conditions for caterpillar pests, including fall armyworm. So it looks as though not only have there been abundant crop hosts, but also potentially non-crop hosts, other things in the landscape. We know that this year has been pretty easy to find fall armyworm in Johnson grants uh, for the first time. And um, I expect that there's a, a relatively long list of other non-crop hosts that it has been using. Um, it's been warm. Uh, and then the coincidence of good rainfall allowing for early sowing of fodder crops in February uh, has brought those crops into close proximity to big fall armyworm populations in late maize and sorghum. The other thing that we've seen quite widely, and I guess it's the agronomist that sort of drew my attention to this, is that it's not only that the crops are attractive to fall armyworm, but their ability to recover from fall armyworm damage, sort of moderate to high levels of damage, is very dependent on the 
the agronomy of those crops. So crops that are deficient in nutrition, poor seed quality, poor uniformity, tend to look as though they are more heavily impacted because they can't bounce back. So there are a few things going on in making an assessment of whether it's just the number of fall armyworm causing the crop to falter or whether it's the crop just not having the ability to respond subsequently. Uh, you've probably seen these, it's probably why you're on this webinar this evening, just the extent of the impact. And the thing that has really surprised me, having spent four years looking at maize and sorghum, is just the susceptibility of the winter cereal seedlings to fall armyworm, the, the amount of plant death that occurred in those paddocks of oats in particular that I looked at was sort of out of all proportion to the amount of plant death we tend to see in the summer crops, so extremely vulnerable. It's important, I think, just so we're all on the same page, because some of the things that I'll talk about from now on, uh, you know, it's helpful to, to really understand how things fit together. So just here on the left hand side is a sort of schematic of, of fall armyworm life cycle. And essentially the moths lay eggs on the plant, typically towards the bottom of the plant and under the leaves. The larvae develop and start to feed on the plant in whichever structures are available. Once they've completed their larval development, they go to ground and pupate in the soil. And it's in that period that they turn into the moth and then the moth emerges through an emergence tunnel and around it goes again. So there is a period when it's above ground and a period when it's uh, developing below ground. The other thing that's absolutely critical is to understand that there are six instars, so six molts of the larvae, and the amount that the relative amount that they eat, as indicated schematically by these green dots, shows that the last instar does the majority of the damage. And so typically when people say the crop has disappeared overnight, it means that there's been an undetected population developing in that crop, and it's only when you get to this stage and the damage ramps up that they notice. So there's no way that damage, uh, major damage can occur overnight, but if you're not looking for small larvae in the crop uh, or early signs of damage, you might miss them. Just in terms of temperature, I've run the development model, which estimates how rapidly fall armyworm will develop. And this is where, you know, sort of I guess my comment about the diminishing risk uh, comes from. If you want to run these for your model for your particular location, there's a, a URL at the bottom there. But what this tells us is, you know, from, from sort of from north to south, is that in the peak fall armyworm periods, if we start the model running, saying an egg's laid in March, April, May, June, July, oh, that's not quite right, <laughs> March, April, May, July, September, November, and then January again, you can see there are periods where it goes through very fast from egg to the end of the larval stage, and there are periods where it takes a lot longer. And the pattern is the same wherever you are. The cooler the temperature, the longer they take to go through. But what is common is in these warmer months, November through to uh, probably March, they are going through very quickly. So this is, I guess, what happens in winter, slow down, much more risk of them dying from other things. So that's kind of where we are and why the winter risk is lower uh, compared with the summer risk in terms of um, the, the rapid uh, increase in population and crop damage. It's absolutely critical that if you have a population of caterpillars that you think or you know can see is doing damage, that you identify what they are and Janine will talk a little bit about the chemistry later, but fall armyworm has arrived in Australia with resistance to the chemistry that you are probably used to targeting um, native armyworm species with. So they will not, fall armyworm will not be effectively controlled by those chemistries, things like synthetic pyrethroids, carbamates, organophosphates. So I'm not going to go into identification. There's some excellent guides. I really like this New South Wales DPI guide that you can get online. And then on our uh, QDAF beat sheet website, we have some resources as well. But, you know, if you don't identify them correctly and see that your main problem is fall armyworm, you may find that you spend money on chemistry and still don't kill them. In terms of checking in cereal crops, it's not too different from doing it in uh, maize and sorghum or sweet corn for that matter. The eggs, as I said, laid on the bottom uh, of the plant, typically underside. The little larvae hatch out. There can be you know, hundreds of larvae from one egg mass. 
The first sign of activity is likely to be these little windows uh, in the leaves, and you won't see larvae, particularly if you're checking during the day. But if you unroll the leaves, you'll find these little larvae, uh, and that's absolutely essential in terms of making an assessment of whether you have full army worm and how big they are and how long it's going to be until you get those large larvae that are going to cause a lot of damage or have the potential to cause damage. Not only do full army worm larvae do a lot of large larvae do a lot of damage above ground, but they also, as I mentioned, have that potential to feed below ground on the plants and result in plant death. That only happens with these larger larvae. So the objective of managing a full army worm population, a damaging population, is to intervene to prevent loss um, that comes with having large larvae. So you're not waiting until you've got lots of large larvae. You're trying to uh, intervene if you um, can see that that problem is emerging. It can be quite difficult to determine what the cause of uh, crop loss is and Fall armyworm larvae are typically uh, inactive during the day unless it's overcast and it can be difficult to find them. And I've had quite a few growers say to me that they had it had taken them quite a while to work out that it was fall armyworm. So it's important if you are getting crop damage but you can't see anything causing it that you check the soil around damaged plants or come out just after dark. Those larvae typically the big larvae come out of the ground at night and get onto the plants and feed on the above ground um, plant material. So if you're really struggling to work out if it's fall army when it's causing the damage, try those two things. How many is too many? Uh, well, we haven't done any work. There's no work done to my knowledge in Australia to make an assessment of this, but there are some thresholds from the states that you could uh, translate to uh, metric if you needed to. They recommend using a sweep net or good old hands and knees. But I guess what I would say is that if you have established crops, not emerging crops that are really at high risk, but you have established crops, it may well be a better option to graze or cut rather than spray. Something to keep in mind. And just the presence of fall armyworm doesn't in itself create a problem. It's really a, the relationship between the susceptibility of the crop and the abundance of fall armyworm and the size of fall armyworm. So on the left there, you can see a really well-established crop. Uh, and if you had small, lots of small larvae in there, that would be much less of a problem than a few large larvae and very small plants. So you sort of get the sense of, you know, what you're trying to do when you're in a paddock making a decision. In addition uh, to those sort of old fashioned techniques for detecting fall army when there was a question about whether drones are useful. So we, we've been working uh, in maize and sorghum with uh, the University of Southern Queensland looking at whether drones can detect fall army worm damage. And the short answer to that is yes. Um, and we expect that there will be a, uh, a tool for doing that. Hasn't been evaluated in pasture or winter cereals, but I'm sure that um, it's a tool that, that may have some application for those crops as well. Uh, so I think that there are some really specific uh, fodder and grazing industry issues that we don't face in um, the broadacre grains uh, and horticulture industries. The first is the, the lack of options. There are no registered options or permitted options for fall army worm in uh, pasture or oats or barley. We need to have some clear guidelines around insecticide use and residue risks for growers of fodder. And that, I think, is inclusive of, you know, grain growers who may grow silage um, from time to time. And I think that biological control options, to my mind, are highly desirable because they have no residue issues. So things like virus, like fungi, like pheromones that may uh, be deployed um, in pasture situations or grazing situations without the limitations that come with insecticides. In terms of control, and I'll, I'll just talk about this in the context of sorghum and maize because there are no options, um, legal options for pasture, uh, but our, we've done a lot of trial work with the products that are available for these crops and the majority of them are, are extremely effective and that's that group here. So the Vandercore, the Affirm, the Success Neo, um, some of those names have changed now, but uh, in Doxicarb Steward, you can see this is the untreated control, the dash line. Um, the population declines naturally over time. But 
uh, the endoxicarb will reduce the population, but we get rapid uh, reinfestation. If you look at this group of very effective insecticides here, we're getting very good control out to about 10 days after which we start to see reinvasion of, of the crops. So you can, uh, I guess, if you have infestations in, in these crops, uh, you can use those products with confidence. Um, and a lot of questions about whether we should spray at night, given that the caterpillars are active at night. All of these products, as you can see from the suppression of the population uh, through to sort of 10 days, seven to 10 days, are very residual in the crop. So those caterpillars will come into contact with that insecticide either today or tomorrow or the next day. You don't need to be getting it onto them while they are active in the crop. Uh, so the general advice is spray when you're going to get the best result in terms of coverage and conditions and uh, use the adjuvants and water labels as per the label because they are important in getting the products to work uh, optimally. In terms of virus, so the two virus products, nu nuclear polyhydrosis virus products, Forlogen and Spotovir Plus, have permits for uh, pastures and a range of other things, fodder as well. We haven't done any work in pastures. We've done quite a lot of work in um, field crops. But here is some, um, some data from the states, from pastures. And to my eye, the outcome from spraying Spotovir and Forlogen is no different to the outcome when they did nothing. Uh, and that, that is uh, largely the outcome that we have seen under high pressure in um, sorghum and maize and sweet corn as well. So it's not a product, these are not products that I would suggest that you use if your crop is at risk of uh, disappearing. Um, they may have a fit for regular use, but I guess we're still learning where they're going to fit. Just insecticide resistance. I've mentioned already that fall armyworm arrived with resistance, high resistance to synthetic pyrethroids. So things like alpha cypermethrin, delta methrin, et cetera, expect no more than 10% control, perhaps less. So really not a commercial option. Carbamates and organophosphates expect 60 to 70% control. So if you're spraying a mixed population where say a native armyworm is dominant, you will, you will uh, find that the fall armyworms survive. And then no resistance uh, over three years of screening by Lisa Bird at New South Wales DPI to these other uh, very effective products apart from the MPVs. Um, and just one last thing I wanted to say about insecticides. So there is an option permitted uh, for wheat, and it's very important when you look at these permits, so it's emamectin benzoate or a firm, that you read the condition. So there is a restriction on application um, only up until flag leaf emergence, not after flag leaf emergence. There are also quite significant grazing withholding periods, six weeks, um, for wheat and 21 days for maize. So these sorts of things are, are really important to be aware of um, as we learn how to manage fall armyworm. And I'll leave it there, uh, Dale, and pass over to Janine. Fantastic. Thanks, Melina. Um, it's a great overview of, uh, yeah, of the the pest and uh, and certainly some of the, the control options and where some of the research has been. Um, and obviously you've made the point of what control options are available at the moment. Uh, and I'd like to pass to Janine Kidston uh, as our next presenter. So Janine is the manager of the farm chemicals team uh, with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Janine sits in the biosecurity and food safety division uh, of New South Wales DPI. And Janine's going to talk to us about uh, the chemical control options that are available in New South Wales and give you a bit of insight into the approvals process and what is and isn't available and what might not be available at the moment. So thanks very much, Janine. Thank you, Dale. I'm hoping you can now see my screen. Can, yes, can we you can. See? Thank you. So you can see my um, introduction or front page. Yes. I'm sorry, you. I don't have a dairy photo, so, so we've got shooting. Um, I'll start with talk, talking about um, what the information that we need for a permit or for registration. Um, so we do have a couple of, of products um, 
registered for fall army work, um, but I'll I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the important information, if we're going to apply for a permit, or if the if a company is going to apply for registration, is is efficacy. We we need to know that it works. So um, we can thank Lisa Lisa and uh, Melina for that work. Um, they've done quite a bit of a lot of work in that space, and and we have a pretty good idea now what works and particularly what doesn't. Um, so we can tick that box. Um, but we need to know how quickly it's broken down or metabolised in different plants. And different plants break down and metabolise or metabolise chemicals at different rates. And so um, in order to set a withhold period so that we know that our animals are not eating too much chemical, we need to know what that rate is. And I feel that that's where the information gap is in some crops and particularly in pastures at the moment. Um, so in terms of future work, that's something that we need to think about and have a look at. Um, and once we know how how quickly it'll be broken down in the plants, then we need to know how quickly it'll be metabolised or excreted by animals. And, um, and we need that information to determine a maximum residue limit. So... Um, so yes, yeah, so we have we have some of that information in some crops, um, but there's quite a bit of work still to do, um, particularly in terms of different crops, different product, different chemicals and different crops. Just go on to the next one. This uh, um, this is a table basically that tells us what what we've got available in oats and other cereals. One of the one of the issues is that that we don't have a chemical option in oats, so um, we'll notice that the foliagen and and spodivere plus are both um, available under permit. These are APVMA issued permits, um, but we don't have a, a chemical option for for um, oats, or indeed. Um, we have, like um, Melanie said a bit earlier, that we do have an option for, for wheat, triticale and cereal rye in um, emmamectin benzoate. So um, one of the um, registered products, um, there are three registered products. Uh, we see registered for millet. Um, also for maize and sorghum is Viego, Viego Fort which is um, tetranilipril. Um, and I've just given you the the harvest days and the um, grazing and fodder withholding periods um, just so that we have an idea about how long um, you need to stay out of your crop or your, um, or your feed until um, you can graze it. Uh, there are some limits on some products with um, in terms of feeding dairy dairy cows that are um, lactating. Um, that applies to all animals that, that are producing milk for human consumption. So not just dairy cows, but um, dairy cows are the big industry that's affected. Um, so yeah, the next um, I've also got a slide for maize, and I haven't looked at all the crops. Um, but I thought it was worthwhile having a look at maize. Um, we'll notice here we've got uh, Viego Fort, another, um, and Viego 200 um, SC, which are both tetranilipril, different concentrations. Um, and, um, yeah, they're both available for maize, um, both with a two-week withholding period. And they're, um, yeah, so they're the same chemicals, obviously the same um, um, a, a chemical group, mode of action group. The other one that we have now registered now for fall army worm is um, methoxyphen, is intrepid edge, which is a mix of methoxyphenoxyphenazide and uh, spinetarine. So... Again, withholding. We have uh, this one has a longer withholding for um, harvest, but um, 
yeah, again, two weeks for um, for for grazing. Um, one of the advantages of this one is that we also have two two actives. So um, yeah, that should give us it'll give us a um, a, a different act, uh, mode of action in our rotations, and um, and the combination um, should hopefully give us um, good efficacy and um, and uh, option in terms of rotation and prolong its life um, before we see resistance. So, so those are the two that we're going to uh, that I that I've looked at for tonight. Um, I didn't want to spend too long uh, looking at at each crop that we have a pro uh, a product available for. Um, like Melina said, we don't have. Um, we're very limited in terms of cereals and we don't have anything um, permitted or registered for pastures. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> hence the, the question mark. Um, one of the things that, that I have done is um, put together a current table of what we do have for every crop from blueberries through to um, through to wheat and everything else in between. Um, which will be, it's not loaded on our website yet, but it will be loaded on the Fall Army Worm in the resources section at the bottom of the Fall Army Worm page. And hopefully I'll get it up tomorrow. So, so that, and that's a list of everything we have that's available that we know works. So, so you can look up permits on the, um, on the APVMA website and you'll see that there are some permits for other products and, um, and there are some product permits for products that we know don't work. So, um, yeah, so go back to, to Melina's talk about what we know is effective and and uh, some of the others that we know are not. And um, when you're thinking about that, um, I haven't listed the ones that we know don't work on on the list of um, of treatments for for the different crops. Um, for for that reason, so that that people don't get too confused, um, it's a big and complicated table because there's a lot of crops that can be affected by fall army wound. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Uh, I'll hand back to Dale. All right, thanks, Janine. And uh, goes without saying that I am still in awe of your ability to pronounce some of the uh, some of the the product names um yeah in terms of the active i always struggle with that so yeah appreciate you giving us a, an overview of of what works in that space and uh i think it's it's worthwhile noting that um that the products that don't work or the products that aren't registered uh create a risk to uh to any industry that if there's any level of residues that show up in in any of your products uh whether that is in in meat or uh, or in milk um, something that puts uh, puts your industry at risk. So I think having those uh, the proper research and uh, the proper registrations really is an important process. Um, so thank you for going through that. And uh, just as a reminder for everyone, we are recording the session and we will provide links to the resources that our presenters have mentioned. So we'll send that out uh, at the end of the session. Um, so thank you, Janine. Um, so we've heard about what the pest is. We've heard about what some of the, the options are at the moment. Um, but in terms of planning going forward, um, we're going to come back to Melina. And Melina, if you're able to run us through some of the potential activity for the, the season ahead and some of the things that we should be considering, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks very much, Dale. And I think uh, it might just be worth, I don't know if you mentioned it, um, but if anyone has any questions, they can just type them into the Q&A box and um, I guess that just sort of speeds up the, the final bit of Q&A. Um, so 
what what to do? I mean, a pretty grim situation if you find yourself uh, with a crop that's been severely damaged by fall armyworm and you're not sure or if you replant, whether that is going to be uh, the experience again. So I think that uh, given the diminishing risk in most regions, if at all, and the likelihood that the risk will continue to diminish uh, as we get into cooler weather, if at all feasible, delaying the planting of susceptible crops will reduce the risk that you will have a damaging infestation. You may still have an infestation, but it may well be that the temperatures slow the fall armyworm sufficiently that the crop can continue to grow and the risk of crop loss is vastly reduced. If crop loss has occurred and you are considering replanting, it's absolutely essential that you make some assessment of whether fall armyworm is still in the paddock. Uh, those larvae don't die as soon as uh, there's nothing to eat. They may sit in the soil, particularly if it's cold, for some time and re the crop um, straight into that paddock may result in exactly the same sort of damage that you've already had. Big larvae sitting in the soil waiting for something to eat. Um, so check the soil, check any remaining plants uh, for larvae uh, and make your decisions accordingly. The other thing just to consider is if you have a crop that has been uh, seriously impacted by fall armyworm or you have a um, a crop that you're going to spray out for some reason that has fall armyworm, those larvae may well just get up and move next door, uh, leave that crop and find themselves walking out of that, that field into whatever is nearby. So I guess if you are thinking about spraying a crop out, then um, spraying a border or spraying a border of the crop, the neighbouring susceptible crop may be a good uh, approach. If you have fall armyworm in a mixed population like Peter talked about with native armyworms as well, as well, making a decision about how you proceed really is dependent on the relative number of each species and the damage potential of each species. And I guess also, you know, where the crop's up to, what, what the risk is. And I, my suggestion would be you focus on the most damaging and act uh, accordingly. And it's already been mentioned a few times, if you're targeting other armyworm species, so you have southern armyworm causing uh, significant defoliation, but you have some fall armyworm in the paddock as well, choosing a product to control the southern armyworm is likely to result in the fall armyworm being left behind. And if it's a relatively small population of fall armyworm, that may not be an issue at all. So just something to be aware of when you're making an assessment of how well your uh, a treatment has worked, um, that you may well have fall armyworm still there. Uh, I guess when we think about spring and summer, uh, I am a little bit apprehensive about uh, what the prospects are. You know, in, in the southern part of Queensland, early sowing of maize um, has been something that many growers have been uh, highly successful with, so sort of largely avoiding fall armyworm um, populations altogether. Uh, and it's, um, I guess, based on the little bit that we know about the patterns of, of activity. And we unfortunately don't have any trap data for the mid-north coast of New South Wales, but the trend is, you know, has been repeated over, over the three years that we've uh, been doing trapping. And you can see, you know, through um, until we get to about sort of December, as we come further south before, until we get to about sort of December, January, we don't see very high peaks of fall armyworm. Uh, similarly, as we go further south as well. So I guess this has given us some confidence and it's certainly been borne out in the last two years that early sowing works. This year, I'm a little bit apprehensive that maybe we're going to drag more population across into spring because of this late finish to the the season, usually by sort of mid-February, we're not seeing fall armyworm um, in crops. So um, the way to deal with that is to check crop, late crops for pupae. So if you have an agronomist or if you are an agronomist and you're worried about whether uh, the infestation that you had is persisting, um, developing slowly, the moths, uh, the, the moths haven't emerged, the larvae, um, have disappeared, but perhaps the pupae are in the ground, um, it may well be worth your while to look for pupae when we get to maybe August. Um, 
and have a look. So I've got some inf there's information on the beat sheet about how to do pupae sampling if you haven't done it, but that at the moment is the only way that we are going to be able to tell what is in store for us in combination perhaps with pheromone trap, um, running pheromone traps in your local area that will give us an early heads up of what the moth activity is like. When it comes to uh, visible damage in those crops, it's really important to distinguish between damage um, that is, um, you know, not, not what we used to see in maize and sorghum, that we are going to see damage from fall armyworm, but what is going to impact on yield and what is cosmetic that may slow the plant somewhat, but not uh, impact on yield or, you know, overly on growth rate. So the work that we've been doing with um, UQ and CESAR and the GRDC DAF funded project on maize and sorghum has provided some really good insights into how much damage and starting to sort of unpick how many larvae per plant um, is too many and will result in, in impacts in yield. And those thresholds for maize and sorghum, particularly maize, it doesn't really matter whether you're growing it for grain or you're growing it for um, for fodder, the impacts on, on the crop development are the same. Sorghum and grain, uh, forage sorghum and grain sorghum are a little bit different and we, we haven't done any work on forage sorghum at this point. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that there are lots of natural enemies attacking fall armyworm. Um, this is a, a, a little selection of them in your part of the world. You may well have started to may well have seen Metarhizium rileyi, the fungal pathogen, um, in the latter part of the season. It's been really quite abundant this year, which tells us that you know not only we had high densities, but we've also had conditions that are suitable for that um, that fungal pathogen. MPVs, in addition to where uh, those fungal, those MPV products are being put on, we're seeing wild uh, MPVs turning up as well. We're not seeing epizootics, you know, big outbreaks that, that result in a large proportion of the population dying with the, with the uh, wild MPVs like we do with Helicoverpa, but certainly cumulatively all these natural enemies have a, uh, an impact. Um, so don't feel like you're all alone out there. And this is particularly important, I guess, where you have a smattering of fall armyworm, not a damaging population, but a population that's building. Um, natural enemies have a really important role in just putting the lid on that population and, and limiting the, um, the build up, not only in that crop, but also um, from one crop to the next as the season progresses. And I just wanted to, I've mentioned the beat sheet a few times. It is uh, um, the website where we put all our resources. You're about to find articles about fall armyworm. You're about to find a whole lot of resources. Um, if you uh, go there and then there's the URL. And that's uh, all I wanted to say about that, Dale. Thanks, Melina. Um, that's Fantastic. Um, I think in terms of uh, in terms of the management options going forward, as you said, uh, we're going into a cooler period now, um, and delaying those uh, delaying those crops is is certainly an option. And yeah, there's certainly been some uh, some questions in the chat about uh, potentially the um, some of the other strategies that uh, that we can look at. Um, just going through some of those now. Um, so Mark Evans in the chat. Uh, so Mark's asked about the potential benefit of pupae busting, um, whether that will help to reduce pressure. Yeah, so it's it's difficult because I, I guess um, if you have a crop uh, now that has pupae under it, then I think there is potential because those pupae are likely to be developing slowly. I guess in crops like maize and sorghum from, you know, November onwards, they're going through so quickly, probably in about a month, that it's unlikely that you're going to be able to get in there and, and pupae bust before um, before the crop, um, uh, what am I saying, it, um, the crop is still growing while those pupae are, are coming through and typically by the time um, the crop is ready to harvest at the other end, those pupae have, um, the moths have emerged and, and gone away. So I think it, it's certainly a tool. I think it would be great if we had some little robots that went up and down the rows and just disturbed the soil enough constantly so that any larvae that go to ground uh, are less likely to emerge as, as moths but uh, we're not there yet. So look, I think in some specific situations, and particularly if there are growers that plant um, 
you know, say maize for fodder have repeated sowings. I think that there there's a real role for these tools that put a lid on the population um, build up as the season progresses. So exactly how we do it is sort of still um, under investigation. But yeah, I think you know definitely. Okay. All right, thank you. And yeah, as always, prevention's better than cure. So trying yeah. to keep those populations down is is by far the the best approach. Yeah. Um, we have two other questions, um, but I did want to uh, just note for everyone. Yeah, feel free to add comments in the chat about uh, where you're actually seeing fall armyworm, as in what crop types, what locations you're actually seeing it. That helps give us a, a better indication of of what's happening because certainly one of the things that uh, that we're all looking for at the moment is exactly what the extent of the damage is so that that can help focus future research. Um, so feel free to offer those comments in the chat. Uh, now, Steve has put a question in the chat about uh, Bacchus WG. Um, is it effective in fall armyworm as a biocontrol? Uh, so I think is it I think that might be BT. Is it Bacillus, um, Bacillus. WG? Yeah, yeah, so the BT product. So look, when we work with BT um, in bioassays in the laboratory, it works very well on fall armyworm. We were quite excited about the prospects for BT. But when we went to the field, we, we ran into exactly the same uh, difficulties that we have with BT with other caterpillar species, that fall armyworm can avoid it uh, and, and not consume it. They have to consume it for it to kill them. They can also consume it uh, and then be a bit sick for a while but recover. Um, I know that there are some agronomists who are sure, you know, ha have had success with it, um, doing a number of, of uh, including a number of additives, spraying at night. There's a whole, you know, whole suite of um, practices that they consider increase the efficacy. So I would say that, um, you know, it's not off the table. And I think what we're doing is looking for products that might add sort of 20%, 30%, maybe even 50 or more. Uh, percent control. So as far as I'm concerned, nothing's off the table. But these products, when we put them into trials and they don't result in sort of 80, 90 percent mortality, they're not products that I would suggest you deploy if it's likely that you're going to lose your crop. Uh, I think if you have a low population and you just want to reduce that, then I think they have they have a role potentially. But I'm a little bit cautious at this point with limited experience with them. But I'd be interested in any experiences that people have with things like, uh, you know, the viruses and the BTs and so on. Yeah, thanks, Melina. Um, yeah, obviously the the most expensive product is the one that doesn't work. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're trying to avoid things that are that have a limited efficacy. Uh, there is a comment in in the Q and A about uh, increasing water rates from say 50 or 100 litres up to 200 plus litres to try and get uh, improved coverage. Um, any comments you'd like to pass on improved coverage using high water rates uh, for products? Yeah, so I think if you read the labels for the products that do have permits or registration, it is in the vicinity of 200 to 300 litres per hectare. Um, and a medium droplet and you know those things are important for both coverage and to get the chemistry into the plants you know those medium droplets have to sit there for a bit uh, so for a while so um, we've done uh, I, I know you know you're probably aware that horticulture uses very high rates of water um, to get much really substantial coverage uh, we one of our um, one of our entomologists did some work going up to 800 litres, saw no difference in the improve in any improvement in uh, efficacy, sort of beyond that two or 300 litre mark. We do all our trial work with about 110. Um, so, you know, in that sort of, you know, 100 to 300, I think seems to be the sweet, port, sweet spot and the chemical companies obviously think so too. And they've done way more work with this than we have. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good feedback. And uh, I've spent enough time filling up spray rigs to know that, uh, yeah, it feels like a bit of a slow process. But again, if it, uh, if it helps make sure they get the best result, um, those better rates, and as the label suggests, and as uh, the research work suggests, mm. uh, they're more effective. So um, that's really helpful. Um, that's most of the, the questions that have been in the chat. Um, 
I did want to start to wrap up, recognising that, uh, yeah, we said we'd try and pull up um, before the end of the hour. Um, so unless there's any last questions, um, we will wrap up. And from here, um, I think there's a couple of things that I'd like to do. Uh, one is acknowledge all the team that's, uh, that's helped pull this webinar together. So obviously, Malene, uh, Melina, Janine, um, the North Coast LLS team, um, and Hunter LLS teams that have been involved, uh, Lilia Camphorst, uh, Donna Cuthill, um, and there's also been Pete Beal who's been on the, on the call. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of those people. Uh, Janine Kidston uh, and the DPI Farm Chemicals team, uh, and also Lisa Bird um, from the DPI Ag team uh, for the work that she's done and contributions she's provided. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, this has been really important for us to be able to share this information and get feedback from you all uh, in terms of what the impact of fall armyworm has been on your industry. Uh, and so we're open to more feedback. If there's more things you feel that need to be done, please reach out and let us know. Um, you can contact each of us at Local Land Services and uh, at DPI as well. Um, and I did want to let you know that we will share all of the resources, um, yeah, via uh, via a link at the end of uh, the webinar. Um, and probably lastly, just recognising this is an industry issue that uh, that crosses state borders, and I think it's it's lovely to see that we've had support from uh, from Melina and the Queensland team. Obviously, yeah. Pests don't necessarily recognise the borders the same way we do at State of Origin time. But uh, yeah, just wanted to say thank you to Melina and uh, and everyone who's been involved. Um, so yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there and thank you everyone for your time.